Wow, Chester, I really thank you for that song. I've, I don't know how many years I've been singing out of this song book. Uh, quite a few. Uh, before that, I had the, the little thin red one. Uh, at a few different congregations, I've had this version, but blue, which is slightly different. But uh, very short, very simple song, but I don't think I've ever sang it or heard it sung before, and it's a very beautiful song, and I very much appreciate that. Uh, by the way, uh, I know you all don't see my notes on the screen that I put for myself, but on the screen it says, turn on mic, all in caps letters. <laughs> Uh, because no matter how good my tech team is uh, in setting up my laptop and setting up the mic, if I don't turn the on button on, it doesn't work. So I did. I turned it on. I left it on. And I'm looking at it right now, and I got a little blue light. So everything should be fine, and uh, hopefully this, this one will record. Watch the battery will die or something. Uh, and I do know that I have two sermons that I still have to do another version of. Uh, to get onto uh, the internet uh, and on our YouTube and Facebook channel. So I will be doing that uh, hopefully soon. Uh, I thank my brother uh, for doing the scripture reading in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, before I jump on from Ephesians chapter 5 in the reading, uh, I did highlight one thing in blue. And although that's not going to be the, the focus of my lessons, I wanted to point out that even in this just absolutely beautiful depiction of Christ and his church. Almost smack dab in the middle of it, we have the way in which he enters into this relationship, where it says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water and by the word. And so we see there, you know, kind of the reverse here, of Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. By the word is how we get belief. But here we see the washing of the water, which we see is that as a re regenerative uh, washing, a cleansing of sins, that you can read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, that they washed away their sins in this act. So, but I, I appreciate my brother in doing this, a little bit of a, an extensive reading, one that we're all familiar with. And it is just a beautiful depiction of Christ and his church. And again, this idea of the church, if you open up Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2, you see that there is no difference. Okay, we've already talked about this at length before, that the, that the kingdom, the church is in the kingdom. If you're in the church, you're in the kingdom. If you're in the kingdom, you're in the church. But we see here in verses 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators of, of God as dear children. So again, if you're children of God, you're in the kingdom. You're in the church. You're, in, you're the bride. But verse 2, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So we see here that in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. This is the same way we see in verse 2. It says, as Christ also loved us and given himself for us. So for those individuals, and there are numerous individuals that say that you don't need to be in a church. You don't need to join a church. You don't need to be part of a church. You just need to be in Christ. Those are, are, are not mutually exclusive. You cannot be in Christ without being in His church. Okay? If you're in Christ's church, then you're in Christ. Those things go together, hand in hand. So when, again, Christ died for us, who did He die for? He died for His children. Who are His children? But those who wear His name. They're in His kingdom. They're in His church. So this is a beautiful passage of Scripture. And you, you could preach volumes of lessons on just this one alone. But let's jump right in. This is a, I'm continuing this series on identification. And so you'll, you'll hear a few things just in the opening to, to kind of refresh and to, and to point back here. But before we jump in, I just want to, again, highlight the message okay, of the importance of the church. We see out of Ephesians chapter 5 that Christ is the head of the church. 
Kind of important, right? That the church is subject to Christ. Kind of important, right? That Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That he might present her to himself as a glorious church. And again, think about verse 1 and 2. Us. Us. He's washing you. He's sanctifying you. He's presenting you to himself as glorious. That's amazing. That's amazing. I, I struggle with combing my hair in the morning. And yet the Lord is going to present me as glorious. He's doing that for me. In verse 30, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You are this in the church. Okay? And again, those who say the church isn't necessary, the church isn't important, think about how the Lord refers to the church. Members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. You want to be part of that? I think so. Verse 31, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a reference going all the way back, all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. And we see there that the institution of marriage where a man and a woman would leave husband and wife and be joined together, okay, and become one flesh, one unified in purpose and direction, but also in body, so that when they join together, what do they do? They create life in a threefold covenant. Man, woman, God. We bring the genetic material, He brings the spiritual. And we see in that covenantal relationship that we have life and we create life and we give life and it's a beautiful thing. And that we have that same relationship. That relationship was given to us to mirror the church. Because it says it's a great mystery, right? I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was to those individuals. I'm sure it was to Abraham. I'm sure it was to Moses. I'm sure it was to all the prophets. And it was a mystery to them at this day. They were even asking Jesus, what is the purpose of marriage? Why do we not have a certificate of divorce for any reason? Because that was never the purpose of marriage. He says, have you not read? And goes all the way back to the beginning. So again, this idea of marriage is a perfect parallel given to us to understand the importance of Christ in the church. So again, a very, 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 very important thing. So, and again, this is why I said I'd highlight and bring back up. There is, again, two different types of evidences, objective and subjective. And just like we did with how do we identify a Christian, and I talked about objective first, and I think objective things are always the more important. I think if you have two different evidences, and you have objective and you have subjective, and the subjective disagrees with the objective, well, I think you need to re-examine the subjective. Because if you can objectively determine something over and over and over again, and you can prove it, and you can identify it, and you can show it, but yet the subjective evidence says, no, 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 well, then you have to reevaluate the subjective evidence. However, I've talked about this. Subjective evidence absolutely is biblical. It is true. The idea of a martyr. The idea of a martyr came from a person who was just willing to give a testimony. But it changed in its definition and understanding because these were people that were willing to give a testimony to death. All they had to do to avoid death was renege on their testimony. Doesn't that sound easy? Right? Doesn't that sound easy? All you have to do to not die a horrible death is just say, ah, I may have been wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm backing away from what I said. And what was the testimony that they died for? These individuals that died were testifying that Jesus was the Christ. That he was resurrected. That he overcame death. That's the testimony. When they talk about a testimony, and when people want to talk about testimony, that was the testimony. These individuals that saw Christ resurrected. And we can believe their testimony because you know why? The one thing that they should have feared, death, they didn't. Because they saw the resurrection. And they knew the power of God. And so that testimony, that martyrdom, 
that we come to believe that subjective testimony we can have high confidence in because these people were willing to die for it. So again, objective and subjective evidence. Well, let's first, we're going to talk about objective evidence of identifying the church. And we're going to talk about, in this lesson, two marks. Okay? One, we're going to talk about a name. And two, we're going to talk about an organization. And I'm going to give you a preview, and because I could not, even me, and you know I love to talk, I could not justify getting this all in one lesson, because either I was going to have to leave some stuff out, or I was going to keep you here for a little bit longer than you would probably want to be here. But we're going to talk about the work, the objective evidences of the work of the church, and we're going to look at that as well. But that's going to be next week. And then, of course, when we finish that, then we'll talk about the subjective evidences of the church. So anyways, what's in a name? You might have heard that phrase, what's in a name? And in Shakespeare, that, that quote comes from Shakespeare, the play of Romeo and Juliet, where in Act 2, Scene 2, Juliet says, what's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. And people like to throw that around and say, well, you know what, look, what any name? Okay, I get what you're saying. But again, if no two people could identify what a rose is, and I said to Mike, get some roses for Raven, but no two people can agree upon what a rose is, he might bring her ragweed, or poison ivy, or poison oak. Might bring her one of those crazy plants that, that smell like death, that attract insects that it eats. We don't know, right? And then you'd be like, well, this doesn't smell sweet. This smells horrible. Well, you, you said bring a rose. Well, what's a rose? Well, I don't know. What's a rose? I don't know. We get that, right? We understand that. A name only has significance. Language only has significance if there's a meaning behind it. If there's not a meaning behind language, then it's unintelligible. And it, 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 it just it's, doesn't exist. It doesn't have any meaning. Children, okay, infants that babble, okay, we don't go, oh, well, that, that's, that's genius. Because it, it doesn't have any meaning to it. They don't even know what it means. They're just making noises, and it's fun. My cats, they talk to me. They meow. And I assume that there's some meaning in their little brain, but I don't know what it is. So maybe that is intelligible, but I can't interpret what it is. So it doesn't have any meaning. So if I was going to write a novel for my cat, it would just be meow, 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 meow. I might be able to put some exclamation marks in there, some question marks. Maybe it sounds like a question, but it doesn't mean anything. And so if you were to pick up that novel, you'd go, well, meow. I don't know. So a name has importance. It has meaning. Okay? In uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So, what does this have to do with names? Christ is redeeming us. Well, what does that word redeem mean? It means to pay for, to purchase. Okay? It comes from somebody. So we all know what this is, right? Everybody has seen a check in some form or fashion. You know, on television, if you've never had a check yourself, if you're a young person. I know very few people are now learning how to write a check. And I don't agree with everything that's on this check. But this is an image I found of a check that kind of represents what I'm trying to talk about right here. I didn't create this one myself. I found it on the Internet. But as you can see here in this check, you have uh, who it's from. Okay, Jesus Christ, Savior, Lord of Heaven. Okay, you have pay to the order. This is who it goes to. And then you would have what you're paying out. So in this case, it says, whosoever believeth in me. And I agree with that statement. Whoever believeth and is obedient, has an obedient faith, absolutely. 
And then we see here that the payment is everlasting life. And we see here they put in John 3.16. And the memo, this is, you know, why? You know, I, I used to write a lot of checks. And sometimes I would have to write what I even wrote that check for. Because I wouldn't remember. So in this case, the, the idea is because I love you. So he writes out this infinite amount. And he tells himself why, because I love you. But you see over here, this is, this is the, the real one right here. This is the very important thing. Because I can fill in all of this other information. Okay? I, I can write a blank check. But without the signature on this side from the individual that's the check writer, that check means nothing. That check has no authority, means nothing. But they don't have a reverse of this. But also... Guess what you have to do to that check? You have to endorse the check. So I could write you a check. I could grab a check right now and write you a check, and I could put $1,000 on it. Okay? I write it directly out to you. I even put my signature on it. But you don't endorse it. You don't sign it. You don't accept it. You don't take it to your bank and deposit it into your account. Well, that check's worthless. It means nothing. So we understand that any name here in that check just won't do. Because there's only one redeemer. There's only one person who can pay that check, that can cash that check. There's only one. And so that name is important. And again, we can see here in Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses. Again, that's the condition we're in when we choose sin. We choose death. And what happens when we accept Christ's payment? Verse 14, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having dis, uh, disarmed principalities and powers, he made public spectacle, spectacle of them, having triumphed over them. We see then that Christ has paid the debt. That name is important. So getting that name attached to you is very important because there's no other name in which man can be saved. We see here in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, where did that payment go? Where did that payment go? In verse 28 it says, Therefore take heed among yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So Colossians chapter 2 Acts chapter 20, verse 28. We see that purchase, the purchase was for the church. The purchase was for the kingdom. Yes, it's individually. It's individually you're being purchased, you're being redeemed, but when you do that, you're collectively in the church. So we see a name is important. Romans chapter 7, verses 4. Therefore, my brethren, if you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Again, go back to that covenantal relationship. Husband and wife joined together, one flesh, bear fruit, multiply. And we see this in the same regard when we join in that covenantal relationship with Christ. We are joined with him and we are to multiply. Well, I went online and I found a template and I made this. Uh, certificate of Marriage. It says, uh, this is a certified that Jesus and the church were united in marriage in heaven. And I put uh, today's date on there, January 21st, 2004. And I put uh, the groom, Jesus the Christ. I didn't sign his name. I'll let that be. But on the bride side, I put my first name there, the Church of Christ, and I put Kyle. And so we can kind of see there, right? We can understand that if I was going to be married to the Christ, if I was going to join into that, 
What do we have? We have historically, when people do that, they take on the name. My wife, when I met her, her name was Richards. Now, her name is Langford. And so when people refer to her, they don't refer to her by her maiden name. They refer to her by my name. Because she has taken on my name because she is my bride. Historically, that's what we see. Now, granted, we might have people changing that today. But that's not the way that it was intended when it was written then. It's not the way that it was intended in Scripture forever. When you take on your Lord, when you take on the bridegroom, you take on his name. You wear his name. So we can see that, and this is not a New Testament only uh, idea. In Isaiah chapter 54, verse 5, For your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. So we can see that that's the way that it was always intended. God didn't, again, create marriage and go, what am I going to do with this now? I don't know. And He didn't send His Son to earth and go, they're just rejecting me. I, I don't know why they're not putting me on the throne. Oh, poor me. Poor me. They rejected me. I better create something in a hurry. What am I going to do? Oh, I'm going to create the church. No! You serve that God? That's ridiculous. That's not the God of the Bible. He knew exactly what he was doing. He planned it from the beginning. This is the way it was intended to be. And we see in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2-4, through 4, For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste version to who? To Christ. But I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds can be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus, again, another Jesus, not the Jesus that we read about in the Bible, not the Jesus that we come to know, but another one of another man's imagination. Even if he's going by the same name, and again, have you ever met a Jesus? I met quite a few of them, spelled like Jesus. But they're not the Jesus, because they're not the Christ. There are many Kyles out there. There, there is a Kyle Lankford in the city of Louisville, spelled L-A-N-K-F-O-R-D. Guess what? Not me. He's got a different middle name. But yet there's another Kyle Lankford, but it's not me. So we see there that if it's a different Jesus one that we're not told about in the Bible, that's not the Jesus that you need to be married to. And it says, whom we, whom we have not preached, or if you have received a different spirit in which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted. So again, you can have a false marriage. You can have a false joining. And guess what you can also do? You can depart so these individuals were joined with the Lord Jesus Christ. They took him on as their Lord, as their master, as the bridegroom, but then some of them depart. And they depart for a fake. They depart for another. They go to commit the harlot. They go to commit adultery, idolatry. They follow different gods. And in this case, they leave and depart Jesus Christ. So we see here that he's jealous. To him, it's kind of a big deal, kind of a big deal whether or not you're going to wear my name. For me, that was a deal breaker. If I was going to get married to my wife and she was not going to take my name, that right there, I take that ring back and I walk out the door and I don't look back. That was a deal breaker for me. If you're going to have my children, if you're going to have my entire assets, if you're going to have joint power with me over my life and with my life to create life and to live this life together, then you have to wear my name. And again, when I went away to war, I signed a general power attorney. Everybody there was like, you're crazy. The people on my MIT team, none of them. I was the only one that gave my wife a general power of attorney. The JAG officer there at Fort Riley, Kansas said, you know what? You do that, you're going to come home and you're going to have a chimpanzee named Bubbles and you're not going to have a home because your wife can do whatever she wants with your money. And I said, I know because she's my bride and I've given her everything into her hand. 
She acts under my authority for my benefit, and I trust her explicitly, implicitly, with everything in me. And they're like, you're crazy. But they did. And it worked out well because I was combat wounded and my wife had to sell my house because I was injured. And she was able to do that because I gave her all of my authority. And she signed things with my name, literally, in order to sell my house out of Fort Campbell. So we see there that a name, big deal. All right, so church names. What do we find in the New Testament? Well, if you look to Romans chapter 16, verse 16, we have Paul, who wrote in Romans, greet one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ greet you. We see here, church of God, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. There are people that have argued with me that have said there are multiple different denominations in the New Testament. One, oftentimes the names they use are not names but descriptors. The bride of Christ is not the name of the church. The name of the church is either A, the church of Christ, or B, the church of God. It's not the, uh, any other concoction that you come up with that are describers of the church. My wife would get a description of me, for example, if I was missing. But it's not who I am, it's a description of me. But when she says who she's looking for, she says, I'm looking for Kyle Lankford, my husband. And then she'll describe me. But they're not looking, because there might be other people that have matched my description. But they're not me. It's not my name. So again, we see here that the church of God and the church of Christ, well, what are they? Are they two different things? What is Christ? What is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus the Christ? Is the his middle name and Christ his last name? Technically, we only know one name of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. Christ was a title. Christ was who he was. He was king. Jesus, the Messiah. Jesus, the anointed. Jesus, the king. Jesus, the Christ. And so we hear, see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, to the church of God... Well, who? The church of God sanctified in Christ Jesus. So when they say the church of God, they're saying the church of Jesus Christ because they're sanctified in Christ Jesus. That You can see in Ephesians chapter 5, his church, his sanctification with the washing of the water and by the word. We see that, that it is saints that are called out and they're called out by what? In the name of of Jesus Christ our Lord. So here we see the church of Christ or the church of God can be used interchangeably. They're the same. Okay, we see here in Colossians chapter 1 verses 15 through 18. This is Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominion or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Again, being put first, being Lord, being in charge, being the head, being the preeminence. And again, he's referring to the church. He's referring to his body. This is the God of the New Testament that we can read about when we read about Jesus. He is the image. He comes before us. He is not the Father, but he represents the Father. He is not the 
comforter. He is not the helper, but the comforter speaks of him. Three individual types, three individual personhoods, the Godhead, but we see that Jesus is God. Also, in Romans chapter 1, verse 7, the churches of Christ greet you. Well, who is it written to? When you open up the book of Romans, to all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. Okay? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So these are churches of Christ in Rome, are churches of God to the church of God. This is an individual specific locale. Where is it at? At Corinth. We're the South End Church of Christ. South End is just our location. If there was only one Church of Christ in Louisville, we could call it the Louisville Church of Christ. This, in case, there was one church at Corinth to the Church of God at Corinth. So it's not the Corinthian church, but it's the church of God at Corinth. So we see here the local individual body. And these are unified. These are one. So these are the church names that we have. These are not descriptors. These are church names. So refer to Jesus Christ as God. Perfectly biblical. Absolutely true. To be a member of the church of God, when you're referring to Jesus Christ, absolutely. When you're saying that you're a member of the Church of Christ, absolutely. Now again, remember, remember that there are false Christs, there are false Jesuses, there are false spirits, and there are false Gospels. So you could be a member of a building, member of a group of people that call themselves the Church of Christ, or call themselves the Church of God, or a church of God, or a church of Christ, and you might not be in the Lord's church. Because again, identity theft is a thing. Identity theft is a thing. People try to present themselves as something all the time so they can steal from you. And Satan tries to present himself as an angel of light to do what? To steal from you life. To steal the glory of God for himself and to condemn you to hell. So we see, so just because they say they were in the name or just because they're presenting the name doesn't mean they are. There are other things you got to look at as well. But if they're not even willing to wear the name, that's an indicator, right? If you were to ever ask somebody what their name is and then they had to sit there and think for a minute and then they tell you, you're probably either A, thinking they just had a head injury or B, maybe they're lying. Police officers do this all the time. Excuse me, sir, what's your name? Uh, d d John Smith. Do you have any ID? Oh, no, no, I don't have any ID. Well, I'm going to need to see an ID. Well, I don't have any ID. Well, I'm going to have to detain you. And then they search them. They got an ID. And guess what? It's not John Smith. Or they have a fake ID. Okay? And the ID says one thing, but it's not real. We had that all the time in Iraq, and we had to check people's passports, and we had to check people's IDs because fake IDs ran rampant. In third world countries, there's not a whole lot of protections from uh, identity theft in that regard or having false IDs. Uh, I remember several years back when they were having the, the real ID system here in Kentucky. One of the real ID machines that were printing real IDs got stolen disappeared. And so they were like, oops, somebody stole our real ID print machine so they could print themselves fake real IDs. That's kind of funny, right? But it happens. So again, the name is important. They've got to be willing to own the name, wear the name, but they've got to be able to have the bona fides that they have the name. Again, like my wife, when, an, uh, when we married, I had to go to the army and had to submit marriage certificates. I had to submit birth certificates. Birth certificates that my wife even existed as a real person. Social security numbers that my wife even existed, that she was a, a, a citizen in the country. I had to submit these things. They had to be legal. They had to be certified. They had to be approved before they were accepted. 
Now, organization of the church. Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 through 19. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that you don't need organized religion. And, and I, know what I know what they mean by that. I know what they are implying by that. But so then I always ask them, so I said, you prefer disorganized religion? You prefer a religion where you don't ever do the same thing twice? Where no one can agree upon anything? Does that sound like a place that's unified? Okay, you know what? Let's apply that to something else. You know, instead of saying you don't need organized religion, do you need organized government? Do you need an organized business? Say if you were to get a job with a business, they just open, okay? Somebody just established a business and they're going to hire new people. And you come in there and they're doing the job interview and you're like, okay. And they're like, you're hired. And you're like, do you not have any questions? They're like, no. And they're like, well, I do. What am I going to do? And they go, I don't know. What do, you, what do you mean? Well, we haven't figured that out yet. What do you do? We don't know. And then they just do something different every day. Do you think that business would be very successful? If no one could agree upon what their job was, if no one could agree what it is that they even did, that's disorganized. That's the definition. And so the idea to apply that on a disorganized family, a husband and wife that are constantly in disagreement, Children that are in disagreement with parents, is that harmonious? Is that what anybody wants? No. And the Lord says, I will build my church. He has the authority to establish it. He decided the organization. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another, as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. In all things, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now, there's a lot of misunderstanding about Matthew chapter 16. A lot of misunderstanding. But simply what he's saying here, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. The keys to the kingdom of heaven... To me, well, the way that I read this, is I'm giving you the comforter who's going to guide you into all truth and you're going to be able to write everything down. I am giving you the keys. I am going to literally send you when the time comes and you're going to unlock the gate when it's time for the Gentiles to come in in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. It's not saying that Peter is the first pope and he can decide to do whatever he wants and, he, and the next pope can decide to do whatever he wants and the current pope is giving uh, same-sex blessings and all this no, that's not what that is. It's simply that what I am going to do is give you the kings, or the keys to the kingdom, and you are going to loosen things, and you're going to bind things, and then when that time is over, that's what's going to be loosed, and that's what's going to be bound. So Gentiles, guess what? I'm very glad he opened up that door. Because if he didn't open up that door for me, I would be stuck out without the covenant of promise. But there are other things that are bound. There are no other names that you can come to God through. You cannot work your own salvation. You can't go back to the law of Moses. Eh, eh, locked, closed. No entry. You can only come through Christ because He is the door. And again, this idea of what is it we're supposed to be doing. Are we supposed to be designing our own churches? Are we supposed to be innovating and creating our own new things? Because that's what you see. I had a professor at the university that I'm at right now who teaches uh, theology. He's in religious studies. And he was talking about growing up in Canada. And where he was at in this big city in Canada is all these big denominations were competing against each other. And they were having rock concerts and doing all this other stuff. Anyways, and he went to finally, his family would just go to, to whatever big show was going on at the time. And then he finally went to one and they, they rented out a, a high school's football uh, field 
and they put buses up there, and they paid a guy to come up with a dirt bike and jump it. And he was just like, at that point, he's like, is this really what the, the church was made for? Is this the purpose? Is this why we're here? Now, granted, he didn't come to the truth. He didn't figure it all out, but he asked a legitimate question. What is the purpose of the church? Well, the purpose of the church is to be good stewards of what they were given. Stewards, you don't create anything. That's the thing. Stewards don't create anything. They didn't make the vineyard. They don't own the vineyard. They simply work the vineyard. They don't get to decide how they work the vineyard either. Those things are dictated to them. Again, and they're to work it with the ability which God supplied. Nothing that I did, nothing that I did, nothing that I do is anything of mine. I didn't pick my parents. I didn't pick my genetics. I didn't pick the time that I was born. I didn't pick anything. I'm just here. I'm just here to do what I'm called to do. And when I see something I can do, I do it. That's it. But it's, I can only do it because God gave me the ability, gave me the gift. He supplied it. And all of these things are to be done so that we may glorify Jesus Christ. That's it. That's our job. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 40. And again, this goes back to the idea. This is not a God of confusion. This is not a God of disorganization. This is the God that we follow 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 and 40. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And then again, let all things be done decently in order. And if you read 1 Corinthians okay, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, those are all about disunity happening in the church. It opens up in the, chapter 1 with disunity. That is not what you should have. That's not what we should see. In the denomination model out there, you do your thing and I do my thing, is not the God of the Bible. That is not what we're told to do. We're told to be unified. Again, organization of the church. Well, we see the organization of church. If we go to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning and craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things to him who is the head, of, who is the head Christ, Verse 16, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying itself in love. And we understand that, right? The human body, everything in the human body works for the body. And if it doesn't, if it doesn't work for the body, then it's typically diseased. It's cancer. Or it's a virus, because it's not part of the body, it's hijacked the body. But if it works with the body, it sacrifices for the body. A, 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 a brilliant analogy of this is, is the idea of uh, autophagy, or apoptosis. The word apoptosis is simply a fancy scientific word that means that your cell has a pre-programmed cell death. And when your cell can no longer divide appropriately, what it does is it says, here I am, Use me. And the cell gives up its individual life, sacrifices itself, signals for other parts of the body to come in and break that cell down and utilize it as spare parts for what? To repair other parts of the body. And autophagy is a fancy word for self-eating. That's that process. So when you have damaged parts of your body, your body reuses it, uses it up. We'll understand this. This idea that everything in the body works together. Every joint works for the body. Now we see here, I highlighted a couple things in yellow. These two things in yellow, apostles and prophets. We don't have those today. We don't have those today. So in mark of organization, if you are going to a place and they say, well, this is apostle so-and-so, or so-and-so is a prophet, that is not a mark of the organization of today's church. 
Was it a mark of the organization of the first church? Absolutely, because there were apostles walking about. There were apostles that were sent, that were called, that were members of the twelve, that were sent out. And there were prophets that prophesied. But we see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? A mark of an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus Christ the Lord? He said he did. Are you not my work in the Lord? If not, if I am not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. What does this mean? You are my seal of apostleship in the Lord. He says, to you, no other apostle has been to you. I've been to you. I've preached to you. I've ministered to you. And what else was he able to do as a seal of his apostleship? Well, this is important. In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 20, we see a very important seal that identified somebody as an apostle. Now, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samara, Samara had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Why? Why is that important? Well, in our Acts class, we talked about that. It was important because Samara had no apostles there. They needed to send the apostles to them. Verse 15, who when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. So they've obeyed the gospel. They're in the kingdom. They're in the church, but they don't have any scriptures. They don't have any written word. They can't go to Walmart and buy a new King James. They have nothing. They don't have the gospels. They don't have the book of Acts as being written currently. Okay? They don't have any of this. Okay? So, verse 18. Uh, excuse me, verse 17. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money. Simon the sorcerer, people that they claimed to be the power of God, he knew. This is so important. He as a magician knew that the magic is in the hands. The misdirection to get you to look here, there, anywhere else, but the hands or what's doing the work. And so when he was observing, and observing the apostles and their work, and seeing what they were doing, he witnessed that, he was, that they were giving the Holy Spirit by the laying on of their hands. And that this was only of the apostles. So he offered them money, and he had a great deal that we know of. He offered them money, saying, verse 19, "...give me this power also." that on whom I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. So the Apostle Paul, when he laid hands on people, did they receive the Holy Spirit? Well, in Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 5, And it happened while Paul was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Different baptism. Okay? The previous one, we see that they were baptized into Jesus. None of them had to be baptized again. Okay? Because they were baptized into Jesus. And then Paul says, in verse 4, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues, and they prophesied. So again, we see that apostleship, a mark of apostleship, as you can see up there, the passage that I just read, the mark of an apostleship, the seal of an apostleship, is a person who can lay hands on and impart spiritual gifts to another. You can't do that. You're not an apostle. Also, guess what? You've got to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Could that happen today? Could there be a person on the way to Shively and be blinded by a light and see Jesus? Absolutely. Is it going to happen? No, because we're not told that in Scripture. 
It has been sent and signified. It has been finished. Okay, the faith has once for all been delivered. No more. We don't need anything else. Everything is sufficient. We were already got into all truth. If we weren't, then the people for the last 2,000 years were missing out. But we have everything. We don't need anything. But you have to be a witness of the risen Jesus. And you'll have people that say they are. You have people that claim they are. You'll have people that claim they have Holy Spirit powers. Prove it. Where's your seal of apostleship? And they can't do it. And again, we're not talking about inane, unintelligible babble. We're not talking about baby talk. We're not talking about made-up words. We're talking about a language that two or more people can agree upon that they're speaking without having any, any intellectual training or practice or knowledge of before. We're talking about people that can heal individuals, not heal them of a cold by bringing them chicken noodle soup, but healing them of serious diseases, of blindness, of mute, of being deaf, healing them of being lame, people that were lame from birth that are able to be healed. That is what we're talking about. Those spiritual gifts can't be given today. Additionally, prophets. We're told in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 11, Love never fails, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. We can even see that here in Ephesians. We can see that, that we, again, until the unity of faith, until the unity of faith, until the perfect man, okay, the measure, stature, and the fullness of Christ, so the people aren't tossed to and fro, until that time comes, you're still going to need prophets, okay? But in James chapter 1, verse 25, we're told, but he who looks under the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. This perfect law of liberty is the liberty that we're given in Christ, his word. And in Jude, verse 3, Beloved, while I was very diligent to you to write concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. Again, no more apostles, no more prophets. You go any place that claims to have one of those, eh -eh. that is a mark that is a mark of a uh, copy, copy uh, counterfeit. That is a mark of a fake. Okay? That is not a mark, an identifier of the true church. They are not in the organization of the true church today. So what we have here is highlighted in red. We have evangelists, we have pastors, we have teachers, we have saints, and we also have deacons, which we're going to talk about. But in this organization of the church, we see uh, the example of an elder or a bishop or an overseer, or a shepherd, and they're all one and the same, and we're going to talk about that. We have highlighted here in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 and 2, and Titus chapter 1, verses 5 through 6. And we see the letter written to Timothy, it says the position of a bishop, okay, is a faithful saying, if a man, man desires the position of a bishop, he desires good work, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Verse 4, who rules his own house well, having children in submission, okay, in Titus, it says, appoint elders in every city as I has commanded you. If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children. So we see here that elders and bishops, as according to, Tim, or according to Paul in writing these letters, can be used synonymously, interchangeably. Bishop or elder, they're both the husband, which means clarified, they're a man. They're a man, it says, a man if a man is blameless, if a man desires the position. So again, this specifies it has to be a man. It specifies he must be the husband of one wife. And I say, and I contend according to the uh, scripture, according to the scripture, that means she's got to be living. That means if your wife is dead, you are no longer qualified because you are not the husband of one wife. And again, why is this important? Now, there would have been polygamy back then. There would have been people with multiple wives. But again, just like Christ in his church, he has one bride that he's concerned about. You have one wife that you're concerned about. In this case, being an elder, you have one congregation to be concerned about. I ain't, look, I'm not, I, I pray for the other churches. I am concerned for the other churches. 
But you know what I don't do? I don't go over and tell the other churches what to do. I don't have any authority to do that. This is my only flock. This is my only congregation. This is the one in which I care about in working the day-to-day -day operations in because this is my bride. This is who I'm joined with. Okay? I'm not worried about others. Just like I, I care about Raven, I care about Mike, I care about Kanita, I care about my mother-in-law, I care about you all, but I have one wife. And I'm in the day-to-day -day operations of my one wife and concerned about her differently than I am everybody else. So we can see the parallel in there, right? So bishop and elder, okay? Now, these terms can be used interchangeably. In Acts chapter 20, verses 17, verses 28, uh, verse 17, called for the elders of the church. In verse 28, therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. So this is addressed to the elders. And it says, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, well, a flock, in this case, talking about sheep, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, that word overseers, also bishop, to shepherd the church of God. So we see their specific purpose, right? Their specific purpose is to shepherd the church of God, not anything else. That's their purpose. Elders, overseers, and shepherds, all used interchangeably. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. The elders who are among you, I exhort... I, who am a fellow elder, this is Peter. Again, the, the Catholics would claim first pope. No, he's an elder. What is he? He's a fellow elder. Yes, he was an apostle, but he was a fellow elder. He wasn't a chief elder. He wasn't a chief overseer. He wasn't the pastor over everybody else. Why? Because there's only one of those. And it says in verse 2, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers. Now, interestingly, that word both... Uh, uh, shepherd the church of God in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, and shepherd the flock of God in 1 Peter chapter, first, uh, chapter 5, verse 2. Uh, in, in 1 Peter, some will say feed. Some will say feed and won't use the word shepherd. Because if you go follow in the next verse, you have one shepherd. It says, Jesus, I am the shepherd. You have the good shepherd, okay? You have one king. You have one Lord, one person over all. So, again, let's talk about these words. This word elders comes from the word presbytos, properly meaning a man having seasoned judgment or experience. An old guy, okay? Now, again, this, this is subjective. I will say that. This is subjective. I would say this often. As a man in a profession where men die young, beware the old man. Okay? As a, as a medic, as a combat uh, NCO, you know, that's, that, that is a truism. That's a true statement. So again, if you're 40 years old and you're in the military and you've been in for 20 years, you feel like a really old guy. You're experienced. And again, if you've been doing any job for 20 years... Your experience, they come to you and they say, hey, we have a problem that no one else knows how to do and you've been doing this forever, what do you know? They come to you because you have experience. And so imagine you live in a society where people say, live to be 50, 60 years old and they die of old age. Again, if you're 30 years old and you've had a child for you know, 10, 12 years, you've been married for 15 years, yeah, you're starting to get a little bit older, are you not? You're considered elder. Now, if you took this past and you say, well, you have to be the elder. You have to be the oldest. Well, that doesn't even work amongst elders because you have to have a plurality. So if you've got one elder who's, say, 70 years old, and you have another elder who's 60 years old, and you have another elder who's 90 years old, well, who's the elder? Who's the old guy? Well, they all are, right? And you'd have somebody say, well, I'm not going to have, and I've heard this, I'm not going to have anybody be over me that's younger than I am. I'm 60 years old. You're going to make somebody an elder over me who's 50? Uh, are you qualified? No. Is he qualified? Yes. What's the problem? Because, again, that last scenario, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, which one's the elder? Is the 70-year-old 70 guy, 70 guy going to be looking at the 90-year-old guy? 
And the 90-year-old guy looking at the 70-year-old guy, and the 90-year-old guy's looking at the 70-year-old guy and be like, you're not my elder. You're not an elder. I'm your elder. I'm old. No. This makes sense. So again, an elder, we can't just say, okay, arbitrarily, 55, 65, 70. But we're looking for a person with wisdom, a person with experience, a person who's been married and been married long enough to have children, and specifically those children are faithful. Okay, and I point that out because it's different than for deacons. Faithful children. But now again, your children are faithful in subjection to your house. Well, guess what? Children leave the house. My children are going to leave soon. Sometimes I wish it would be quicker. Sometimes I want it to be much further away. But they're going to leave. Does that mean I'm no longer qualified? Well, were they in subjection to my house? Were they believing children? Yes and yes. Okay, yes. Now, again, what if I have one child? I've heard that argument as well, too. Oh, he's only got one child. It says, believing children. Children, plural. I am no English. It's plural. You've got to have two. Okay, have you ever been to an establishment where it says, no pets? It's plural. Does it allow you to bring in one pet? Or does it stop you at the door? Some place says, no kids. Can you bring in one kid and say, well, this is only one? No. It doesn't work that way. The plural includes the singular, but the singular does not include the plural. One wife doesn't include multiple wives. But believing children includes all children. Okay? There you go. Super simple and easy, right? Shepherd. Uh, now, again, this word, there is a different word for the chief shepherd, which is Jesus Christ. I don't have that on here. But I have the word that we would have and what we would uh, classify as a shepherd. And this is uh, pimano. Okay? The, the definition of this actually is to act like a shepherd. It's not even a shepherd. It's to act like a shepherd, to feed the flock, to be a shepherd, but to act like one. Because you're not the shepherd, but you're a shepherd. And so this idea of a shepherd, we don't really need to define this too very much, right? Everybody has heard Old MacDonald had a farm and all this other stuff. We know what a farm is. We know what people do, do these things. They take care of the animals, okay? They guard them. They make sure they're fed. They make sure that, they're, that they have all of their, their medical care taken care of, everything. They watch over them, right? We see that. We don't have to go over that too very much, what a shepherd is. Now, this is what they translate pastor into, Okay? To pastor or to feed. And again, I get it, pastor, but it's not exactly it. Shepherd is what it's referring, act like a shepherd. To pastor is the act. Okay? So you're taking your sheep out to pastor. But then what they end up having in their organization is they'll have elders, bishops, and pastor. They'll have the person who's over everything, right? And they, I get asked this all the time. Are you the pastor? Are you the pastor? Are you the pastor? I'm like, nope. I'm an evangelist. It's different. And they're like, but are you pastoring? I'm like, well, I, I can do a lot of stuff. Doesn't mean I am. Okay? And I'll, I'll say this. I said, you know, uh, I'm not a doctor, but I played one in Iraq. Doesn't mean that I am that. Just mean I might do some of the same similar things. Doesn't mean that I am. There's a qualification. Have I met all the qualifications? I've met them, some of them, but there's not a plural of here. So I can't be by myself. There's got to be a plurality. And again, I don't have that. So again, don't meet all of the qualifications in this location. And then again, a bishop, an overseer, episkopos. Bishop, overseer, same thing, different translation. It was in this time used as an official title in civil, uh, civil life. It is an overseer, a supervisor, a ruler, especially used with reference to supervising function exercised by an elder or presbyter of a church or congregation. Okay, that's how it's used. So again, these three words, the exact same thing. Just descriptors, just descriptors of a guy who's apt to teach, and there's a whole bunch of other qualifications to an elder. We're not going to go over all of them. But I'm just saying, if you have an organization that has elders and a pastor, or pastors and a bishop, or a chief bishop, or a chief pastor, or a lead pastor, or any other stuff, not in Scripture. 
If you have anybody that has a female pastor, not in Scripture. You have anybody who's a bishop or a pastor or an overseer or an elder who's not married, not in Scripture. Doesn't have children, not in Scripture. Those things, definitely objective marks. Okay, Point that out because these are the things that you're going to find in other congregations that's going or other denominations or denominations or other places that are not in Scripture. These are the things you can look at. Okay, And again, really quickly on deacons, uh, we see that uh, deacons are mentioned in 1 Timothy chapter 3. They're not mentioned in Titus. Uh, it could be just because they simply didn't have as many people in that area. They didn't need deacons. Could have been a small congregation. Could have, could have been you know, an affluent congregation. Could have been a congregation that didn't have very much need, didn't have any widows. Because we see deacons arrive when you read it in Acts and you get to, I believe, Acts chapter uh, 5 or Acts chapter 6. You have the Hellenist uh, widows who were the Greek widows or, you know, from the area of, of Greek, the Hellenists. And so what you have is you have individuals that had a need. And so that need required there be men to service them. And again, these men, husbands of one wife, rule in their children in, in their own house as well. Now, what we see that it doesn't say uh, is that it doesn't say they have to have faithful children. Now, that word children is the exact same word. Children is the exact same word. Yet, we don't have a scripture that says that a deacon must have faithful children. It just means he must rule his children well. So, if you have an infant, you have a child. You have little bitty children, you have children. Okay? Are you ruling them well? Are they acting a fool? Do they, are they respectful? Are they decent? Are they kind? Are they well-adjusted? All these things are important, but them being Christians isn't required. Not at least according to the Scripture. And again, organization of the church, evangelists and teachers. Um, we have uh, evangelists defined as an evangelist or bringer of good news. It's used three times in Scripture, right here in Ephesians chapter 4, Acts chapter 21, verse 8, and again, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. In chapter 21, we see Philip listed as an evangelist. And I believe and contend that this is the same Philip that you can read about in Acts chapter 5. And we see there, and then Philip went down to the city of Samara and preached Jesus, or excuse me, preached Christ to them. And then later on, it says he preached Jesus unto him. Okay, to the Ethiopian eunuch. And that, required, that included baptism when he preached Jesus unto him. So we see that an evangelist is a person who's a bringer of good news, who brings the gospel to those who don't have it. That's an evangelist, okay? Uh, we see here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, Timothy is told to do the work of an evangelist and fill the ministry. There are other things that are included in evangelism as well. But... With that, the job of evangelists, and you can see in verse 2 from that same passage, is to preach the word, be ready, in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. This idea of convince is to expose or convict. The idea of rebuking here, not necessarily negative thing. It can be either positive or negative. It's to render out honor as due. But again, what you would have from the understanding of this is to be rebuked is to warn people to prevent something from going wrong. Again, telling people, don't go do this, because if you do, bad things are going to happen. That's the idea of kind of what we're looking at here when we see rebuke. And then to exhort. The idea of to exhort is to call to or for, to, uh, to be exhorted or to encourage. And the idea of teacher Again, there is a lot that goes into teacher, but we're not going to talk about all of the things that incorporates into a teacher, how uh, there's greater required of them. But for a teacher, this word here just simply means an instructor instructor, uh, acknowledged for their mastery in the field of learning and scriptures, a Bible teacher, someone who's competent in theology. So again, if they do not know first principles, if they do not know how to make application, okay, they are not qualified to be a teacher in the church. Now, they're qualified to be taught. They'll be qualified to go out and work with other people and try to help people bring along. I'm not saying that you have to be a master, but I'm saying if you're going to be called upon to teach the flock, if you're going to be called upon to instruct others in the ministry of of the church, 
you got to be competent, you got to be capable, and that's what we're talking about. But again, everybody is either going to be a elder, deacon, evangelist, or a saint. Period. We got no other roles. Got no other roles here, no other positions, nothing else in Scripture. And again, are you in the Lord's church? And by the way, everybody that's all those other positions, they're also a saint. And your overseers, guess what they're also? Your servants. Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about this hopefully in the next class that we have, and giving the example of washing the feet. I wanted to get into that today so I could use that example today, but I'm going to go ahead and give you a preview of it. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ submits himself to the lowest position, washes the feet of his servant, and says, if I've done this to you, you must do that also to others. And so he's teaching the idea of service and humility and submission. And that's what your leaders are doing. Again, with all long suffering, they're to encourage and strengthen and watch over the flock. Okay, the sheep. They love the sheep. They care for the sheep. So again, they're servants as well. They're saints. So the question is, are you in the Lord's church? Again, I would say to you, if you cannot point to these objective things, and there's a lot more that we could go over, okay? But these objective things, if you can't say, my church is wearing the name, my church is organized in this way, okay? These are the positions. If you can't say that, well, you're probably in a counterfeit. You're probably, you're probably serving another Jesus. You're probably accepted a different spirit because you believed a different gospel. But Paul also wrote to the Galatians, you know, if he himself brought another gospel, let him be accursed because there's no other name. There's no other name which you can save by, by in heaven other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the actual Lord Jesus Christ, not a counterfeit, not a fake name, because that check will bounce if it's a fake name. It will not go through, because He is the door, He is the way. And if you don't have these things, which are front and center, drive up and down any street, drive up and down any street in America, in the globe, and look and see, what do they have? What do they call themselves? Are they calling themselves Hearts on Fire Church, Community Church, Home of the Believers? What are they calling themselves? Kingdom Bride, Come in Church? What, what, what are they calling themselves? Because if they're not even going to wear the name, then they are not part of the Lord's body. So there you go. One good indicator. You see the name and you go in. And you say, hey, how are you? And they go, hey, I'm fine. And they go, my name's Kyle. And they go, oh, my name is Pastor Mary. Pastor Mary, no thank you. Or they say any other number of things. Those things are not marks of the true church. They are not following the organization structure. Objective. Okay, you can see that. You can witness that. You can test that over and over and over again. And you can see if it follows the pattern. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 39. I can't add you to the church. Chester can't add you to the church. No one can add you to the church save one. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. In uh, Acts chapter 2, then Peter said to them, Repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. That's us. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Remember, Ephesians chapter 5, He does it. He washes them with the water. He sanctifies them by the word. He adds them in. Not me. Nothing that I've done. Nothing that I've created. All I'm doing is following the Lord's will. He does the work. He does the circumcision. He does the cleansing. He removes the sin. And He brings the Spirit back to life. Not me. Not any work that I've done. Nothing I can do by my hands. And if you're in the Lord's church, if you're in the Lord's church, in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, this is a message for us. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and 
beloved, the elect of God, holy and beloved. If you're in his church, you are beloved. That's the terminology. He says, hear my son, my beloved son. This is the terminology that Christ and the Father has for you. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against one another, even as Christ forgave you. If you're in the church, you've been forgiven. And guess what that requires? You, so you must also do. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which you also were called into one body, and be thankful. If you are in the one true church, that is something that you can be truly thankful for because you are an elect, you are holy, you are beloved. But you know what? Just like it mentioned in Corinthians, you can depart. You can depart for a fake Jesus. You can depart for a fake spirit. You can depart for a fake gospel. And if you've done that, or if you've chosen any other way to commit spiritual adultery, idolatry against the Lord. If you have gone on and you have done other things, you have fallen your own way, you can always come back. Because again, the scriptures point to us when Jesus is teaching about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And they're asking about a divorce. And why? And Jesus tells them it was never intended to be that way. Because the way that it was intended to be is even if that horrible thing happened, you were intended to forgive because they're your spouse. They're bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. They love you and you love them. And that's what you're supposed to be able to do because we see that when we sin, when we fall short, when we go off, when we come back to our Lord Jesus Christ, He forgives. He accepts and He washes us and He cleanses us and he makes us glorious. So if you've fallen away, you can come back this very hour. If you've done it individually, privately, no one else knows, just you and the Lord, you can go to God in prayer. But if you've done it in a public fashion, you've brought disreproach uh, upon the Lord's uh, church and his name, you've, bared that, you've carried that name in vain, you've done evil things, you can publicly repent of that. You can come forward and we'll forgive you and we'll pray for you and help you out in any way you can. we can. And if you're not a Christian, if you have not been added to the church by the Lord through baptism, then why are you waiting? I call upon you now and come forward now as we stand and as we sing.